Open up your Bibles to Joshua chapter 24. We're going to read starting off there in Joshua 24. Um, thank you for being here tonight. It's good to be home. It still feels like it's new to be back home after I've been gone for a week. To those of you who are outside, welcome and hello. I think I already caught most of you. Um, Ryan has to leave a little bit early tonight to go to work. So those of you who are outside, um, if you've got a comment tonight and you want to participate in class, just shoot a text to Mark. Um, Mark is sitting in front of the screen, and I think that he'll be able to see that, and he can share your comment for those of you online. Thank you also for being with us in that way. Um, and so if you're watching, it's probably on Facebook Live. Drop a comment into the uh, comment section, and, and we'll try and get that done as best we can. I need to ask for a little bit of forgiveness tonight because I changed my mind, which is not really that unusual, but often whenever I change my mind, it's not, um, it's not creating a situation where I have to redo something. But if I could go back in time, I would not have done my last lesson, at least in the way that I did my last lesson. Um, and so I'll, I'll try not to repeat stuff that would have been in the last lesson, um, but let me tell you what I'm going to do here. So in Joshua chapter 24 and verses 14 and 15, last time what we did was we read verses 1 through 13. But let's just summarize 14 and 15 because you can see the point there. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river. That's number one. The river that he's referring to is the Euphrates River. That's on the north side of the promised land. And you will remember that Abraham came from on the other side of the river. Throughout history, that's the home um, of, of Abraham, where Abraham come from, came from. It's the home of the Hittites. It's the home of the Assyrians and the Babylonians. Um, those across the river. That's who he's referring to. And... Um, and so it's your family past, the gods from your family past. That's what we did with that last time. The gods that your father served beyond the river and, he says, put away the gods from Egypt. That is referring to um, this people who came out of slavery from Egypt, uh, wandered in the, promise, in, in the wilderness on their way to the promised land. And so we talked about the gods... From Egypt, the gods from our past. Um, I think that specifically, one the point. I think. Hold on a second. I got to get my thoughts together. The way to make that point that was better than any other came from Ezekiel chapter twenty, when Ezekiel says, "I talked to your fathers and told them to cast away those gods." And so the idea is, in our lives, when we become Christians, we cast away the gods of our past. And so the gods beyond the river, our family gods, our history, the gods of Egypt, what we're doing with that is our own past, the things of our own past that we should have cast away. Um, and he says, and serve the Lord, verse 15. And if it is evil in your sight to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river, there it is again, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. And so this is the Amorites, the place where the children of Israel are going in the land that they're taking over. This is what I would refer to as the world. It's the world that we live in, the things that are happening around us. It's the air that we breathe that sometimes we don't even know um, to appreciate the gods that may be influencing us or that we may be serving. Uh, and so Joshua finishes by saying, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So last time, I guess two Sunday nights ago, what we did for this class was we said, let's talk about this. The gods of our family past, the gods of our own past in Egypt. We talked about the gods of the world uh, and the land of Amorites and then the choice to serve God um, at the end of all that. Please don't just outright erase it from your memory because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build on that foundation. But I wish that I had not done that um, because I've got this whole list of idols that I want to address. And I sent an email to some of you to ask about this. I'm not entirely sure how to address that because 
If I just say, okay, tonight we're going to talk about this idol, and then next Sunday we're going to talk about this idol, and then next Sunday we're going to talk about this idol, it'll be the end of 2021 before we get through everything. And that's just not practical. Um, so it occurred to me, last week I had a little bit of time to think, and it occurred to me that most of those idols that I want to talk about fits into one of these three categories. Our family past, our own past, and the world that we live in. And so I just want to take this Joshua section, and tonight what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the one, and this is where Joshua starts, but I'll tell you, even more than just being where Joshua starts, I think it's fair to start here because this is the hardest one for me. I feel like tonight's lesson is me being open and honest about my own idols and my own trouble as we talk about our family idols, the gods of our fathers. And um, So tonight, that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about our, our family as um, idol, potential idol, worshiping that instead of God or in place of God. Next Sunday night, we'll talk about our own past and some of the things that we may have supposed to have turned loose of when we became Christians, but maybe you're still hanging on. The Sunday after that, we'll talk about the idols of the world. What is it that the world worships? And then... Um, on the Sunday after that, we'll talk about some positive examples in the Bible of people who chose God instead and prioritized him. So that's the plan for now. <laughs> you know me well enough to know that it's difficult to say that's the plan. Um, this one's hard for me. In Genesis chapter 1, God created everything. And, um, oh, sorry about that. There's what I just talked about on the slide. <laughs> I'm moving on now. But it's there behind me in case, um, in case you want to see that and, and write that down. Um, Genesis chapter 1, God created everything and he said it was good, it's good, it's good, it's good. In Genesis 1, 31, it was all very good. And then in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, he said it is not good that the man should be alone. Um, and so he created for man, for Adam, um, a wife corresponding to him, a helper fit for him, depending upon what version you're reading from. And so it's really hard for me to think about treating my wife um, as a negative thing <laughs> because she's created as a blessing for humanity. Wives are created for husbands. And I think most of us husbands would say, amen, they're created as a blessing for humanity from the very beginning. Our kids are a blessing from God. There's verses in the Bible that say it. Your children are a blessing from God. Um, I went to this. I'm not going to take the time to do this, but uh, I found something interesting. In Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1, um, Eve conceived and bore Cain, saying, and this is what Cain's name means. Sometimes in the Bible, we'll see this three times tonight in our study. Names almost always mean something. And so the name Cain means something or sounds something like, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Um, so God creates a, a, a wife for the man, and then God provides a child who is a gift. I have gotten, I have received from the Lord um, this gift. But I think that it's probably not out of the realm of reasonable to say this uh, so that we can all understand. Sometimes God's greatest gifts are God's greatest test. And so when we are thinking about idols and idolatry, what we do with idolatry is we take a good thing and we make it an ultimate thing. And that's when it's no longer a good thing for us anymore. It's um, a changing of the order. Um, reprioritizing. If you think about Exodus chapter 20 and the Ten Commandments, the first four commandments, I am the Lord your God, serve no other gods. That's what this class is all about. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Uh, and remember the Sabbath, it's about fellowship with God. And then the next command right after that is family related. Um, honor your father and mother. 
but in that order. We're not allowed to take the order of those things and swap them around. To put honor father and mother above honor God. When you take the order of something and you swap it around and you reprioritize, a good thing is no longer a good thing when it becomes an ultimate thing. That's an idol now. Uh, we put it above the place where, where God is. And so tonight what I want to do is I want to talk about mine. And I, I make no um, hesitation to, to just admit, you know, this is, this is the one I think that's the hardest for me. It's the most painful, I think, to look at the examples that we're going to look at tonight. But uh, I, I, I would hope that I would hope that I never fail to teach or talk about something just because it's a little painful or it hurts me personally. Is there anything you want to say before we get started in terms of taking family relationships, um, husband, wife, parent, child, or any kind of extended family relationship and putting that in the place of God? Is there anything you want to say about that before we get started? General comments. Any examples in the scripture that you can think of or that come to mind? I'll give you the first word on some of that if you want to make any comments about that. Okay, well, let's just start then. I got several examples that I think um, illustrate this point. The first one is the hardest, Genesis chapter 22. Let's turn over there. Genesis chapter 22 is the chapter where God tells Abraham to sacrifice his son. Um, there's something that I want to do with this passage, though. Whenever you get to Genesis 22, I guess it's not that big of a deal because everything's pretty close together. You probably don't need to leave your finger there. But turn back to Genesis chapter 17 because there's, there's something about this particular kid, Isaac, that, I mean, if you told me, hey, Ryan, sacrifice your son, okay, um, no, <laughs> I mean, I don't know, I don't know how else to respond to that, um, you know, um, it's a hard command anyway, but I think what the text does is the text paints a picture for us that this is even way harder than we might imagine, if that could be possible. Um, in Genesis 17, in verse 15, God makes this promise to Abraham and says, this time next year you're going to have a son named Isaac. Look at verse 17. Abraham fell on his face and laughed. That word's important. Remember, remember when I say I got a color code? Blue means words in my Bible. The word laughed is highlighted in blue in that section. Because what that says to me is, pay attention to this word, Ryan. And here's the reason why. Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. Now, somebody who has a text note in your Bible, look at the text note next to Isaac and follow it to the bottom of your page and tell me what it says. Please. Sounds bossy. What does Isaac mean? Or sound like? You got that, Lisa? He laughs. So God says, you're going to have a son. Abraham bah! laughed. And God says, and you're going to call his name laugh. Laughter. Isaac means laughter. Okay, turn over to chapter 18 and verse 12. Um, this is going on. Sarah hears the whole thing happening. Verse, verse 12, Sarah laughed to herself, saying... After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? And at the appointed time, I'll return to you about this time next year and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. The story of Isaac. And when I say Isaac, I'm tempted to say laughter. His name means laughter. 
The story of Isaac is a story of laughter. Abraham, you're going to have a son. Ha! Sarah, you're going to have a son. Ha! Everybody's laughing. It's hilarious. The story. Um, chapter what? What is the next chapter here for this? 21 in verse 2. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time in which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him whom Sarah bore Isaac. I, you got another text note there. Your translators put the text note in because they really want you to know that Isaac means laughter. Five, Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And there's even another one in chapter 26 in verse 8. I promise there's a point. When he'd been there a long time, Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, looked out of the win window and saw Isaac laughing with Rebekah, his wife. The story of laughter is all throughout the story of Isaac. And I would think that most of us who enjoy our kids get this. Um, our children, for most of us, um, are in many cases a great source of happiness. They're the source of our joy um, many times. And, and what you do is you take that reality for your own self and your own life and you put yourself in Abraham's position, a hundred years old. And he's been expecting this child for a hundred years and he he, the, I don't, I don't want to say he lost hope because the Bible tells us that he believed that God was going to do it and that belief was counted to him as righteousness. But how can you be 100 years old and think to yourself, okay, the promise is still coming. I don't know what's going what's to happen with this. But God finally gave to Abraham this child of his joy, the child of his laughter, the child of promise. And then whenever you come to Genesis chapter 22, starting in verse 1, God tested Abraham. I tend to think to say the very least. And he said, Abraham, he said, here I am. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him. And his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told them. And on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place from there. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Um, the only last thing that, that I would have to say about this, and then I'll just kind of stop and breathe and give you a chance to make your your comments or your thoughts, but I want you to notice that here is something really hard. I mean, it doesn't feel like those words carry enough weight <laughs> to say really hard. Here is something, from my perspective, near impossible, what God asked from Abraham. And Abraham's words and his response to this situation is, I'm going to go worship God. God comes first. Even before the child of my joy, the child of my laughter and the child of promise. I told you it's hard. How many of us, how many of us, I mean, have done exactly the opposite and have put our own children ahead of God? Or have taken our own children and put them in the place of God to serve them as if they are not a good thing given by God as a gift, but an ultimate thing that my entire life revolves around. Do you remember the question that we asked? I think it was on the second or the third class when we said, what thing, if it were taken from you, would cause you to lose all sense of hope and joy and happiness and fulfillment and meaning of life? That's probably a good indication of where your idols rest. How many of us would, would name our children there? 
Got any thoughts on that one? Anything you want to say? Yeah, Maria. I think it's especially hard when you're trying to raise your children the way you believe God wants you to raise them. And especially in this world that seems so permissive and, you know, has almost, you know, puts the, puts forth this bottle that you're supposed to be buddy-buddy with your, with your children and, and best friends and, you know, I mean, to have to, I guess, discipline or stand your ground on something that you truly believe God is telling you to do for your child and you get total pushback, that's hard. Yeah. Parenting in general. I mean, that's, you know, really hard, but, I mean, that's where I think the faith in the Lord Yeah, discipline is hard. We got to do things God's way. Others? Thoughts? Yes, it looks like it. No. Um, yeah, can you think of any greater gift? I, I, I think about it from this perspective. Can you think of any greater gift to give your kids than the gift of showing them that they are not first? God is first for me, even before you. And to pass that on to them so that they will understand God is first. The gift that you give in that is eternal. Becky? Yeah, good. So just to kind of summarize, in case that didn't come through the microphone, Becky said, uh, oftentimes we sacrifice our kids on other altars besides giving them to God. We're just stewards. Look at this one. Turn over to the next one, Luke chapter 14 and verse 25. There's a word involved in this one. I love words, you know. Um, Luke 14 and verses 25 and 26. So God specifically says to Abraham, Abraham, I'm calling you to be mine and to follow me wholly 100%. And it says he, he tested Abraham and Abraham did. He put God first. And God finished that story by saying, now I know that you fear God. You have proven and demonstrated that I'm first for you. You realize Jesus said that too. Like, this is not just a Bible concept where we say God first and we all know it deep in our hearts because it's what we feel about Christianity. Jesus specifically said the words. We don't have to wonder about this one. In Luke chapter 14, verses 25 and 26, great crowds accompanied him and turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate... Mm. There's a word I have to look at. 
does not hate his own father and mother and wife. I told you this one's hard for me. And wife. Jesus says to Ryan Boyer, if you come to me and don't hate your own wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life. Don't forget that one. He cannot be my disciple. You can't come to me and have other things first. I looked up the word hate. There are two definitions. The first definition in BDAG for the word hate is what we would expect. Hate, despise. The same thing that, that exactly what you would expect from the word hate. The second definition, though, probably makes a little bit more sense in this context. Jesus is not saying, God said to honor your father and mother, but I'm telling you to undo everything from the entire Old Testament. Now you have to hate your family. Come on, we know better than that. Um, the second definition of the word hate in BDAG is to be disinclined to in contrast to preferential treatment. Preferential treatment is the key here in what Jesus is ultimately getting at with this word. And what he's saying is this, is, this is the way that Matthew worded these words from Jesus. He's saying, if anyone comes to me and prefers, gives preferential treatment to, puts before me, um, father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciples. You see in verse 27, a part of that, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That's the own life part. You got to be willing to give it all. Um, I am not going to get out of order in the list of priorities, any of these things and prefer over God, my mom or my dad or my wife or my children or even myself. Listen to Matthew. This is Matthew's version. Matthew 10, 37. Whoever loves father or mother more than me, there's the preferential treatment. Whoever loves father or mother more than me, listen, is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Uh, did you hear those words? Did you hear what he said? Cannot be my disciple. You got that? Jesus says, either I'm first or nothing at all. Yeah, Mark? I think Jesus even understood what he was saying. You think? You think Jesus understood? I'm sorry. I wouldn't tease anybody except Mark. <laughs> It's not something that Abraham arrived at just immediately. God allowed him the time and the opportunities to be approached by faithful uh, events to go through. And then this final one, in my mind, that we're referencing here, this is the one where, yes, it's shown to God, but to me, it's ultimately Abraham is showing himself to himself that where his, or where his faith is, mm -hmm. where he voices, well, I know God, maybe God's just going to bring him back to life, and that's how he's going to do it. And 
you know, maybe he's thinking back to, is anything too hard for the Lord? There's, yeah. There's a footnote there where God's been saying, is anything too wonderful for yeah. the Lord? Which, you know, it's so impressive. Yeah. For God to tell him that and set that seed in his memory of, is anything too hard for the Lord? Yeah. Can you imagine? I mean, this is not this is not easy stuff that we're talking about here. Adam, go ahead. I was just thinking about this a little bit from the perspective of the one family member maybe who is being idolized and you sort of realize how unhealthy it is to be put on that pedestal and to be someone's whole world is you and they're so wrapped up in you, or whether it's a parent or child or spouse that Inevitably, we're going to let each other down. You know, if we put someone in that elevated role, it's just going to be even more devastating than it needs to be. And it's going to rock our foundation, which is supposed to be built in Christ. Yeah. You know, I, yeah, that's a great... I want to do something with that, Adam. But it, to just in case nobody on the microphone was able to hear that one, it, he, he talked about how unhealthy it is to put somebody on that pedestal. But I would use the word unfair. Do you remember what we're doing with God? Um, God is the source of my joy. He is the source of my fulfillment. He is my meaning and my purpose in life. And when I take that and I put that on Becky's shoulders, do you remember in the class when we said idols um, will always break your heart? And how here you create an idol and you put it on a cart and the animals have to carry it around and all of this. They have to bear the thing. I'm putting something on her shoulders that she cannot and should not have to bear my own fulfillment and meaning and purpose and happiness. Um, everything breaks down when we reorder things. I'm not saying don't treat your wife and your husband and your kids and your family as a good thing. They're gifts from God. They are not the ultimate thing. God is the ultimate thing, and only He deserves our worship. Yeah, yeah. Job is a great example, and even his wife, even his wife, uh, gave him a hard time with that. So I'm, uh, uh, I'm going to use the words "running out of time." No, I don't want to be that guy. I'll go ahead and stop. Here, let me do this. I'll throw up some passages on the board, and you can write those down and see if you can figure out what I was going to say with it. Paul. What? I would love to repeat what you said for the microphone, but I have no idea what it was. <laughs> I'll just have to try. Some, about Isaac being the willing sacrifice, is that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my, my time is over. I, I wish that it wasn't because in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul here is talking about marriage. And, and he says, Paul says, in some cases, in view of this present distress, it's better in some cases not to marry. And... He goes on and he uses these words um, about the dangers of marriage. He says that what, what we're trying to do right now is to secure our undivided devotion to the Lord. And in some cases, that can be a hindrance. God's gift can be a hindrance if we don't use it in the way it was intended. In Deuteronomy 13 and verses 6 through 11, there's this whole section that starts in chapter 12 and verse 29 where God says... Um, if there are idols in your company, this is what you do about it. And so in chapter 13 and verses 6 through 11, the idea is if there's idols in your family circle, um, this is what you do about it. And he's not messing around. You get that stuff out. Um, and maybe I'll have another occasion to refer to Leah's example at some point. I, I wish that there was time for that. But uh, let's finish with this. Do you realize in this conversation that as hard as this is, that it's exactly what God did for us? Has that popped into your head throughout this conversation? Oh, giving my kids. Come on, that's tough. Giving up my wife. God so loved 
the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's not like he's asking us to do something that he himself is not willing to do. And so here is the invitation part of this lesson in thinking about family relationships. Therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river, the household family gods. Put those gods away and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods that your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He's first and nothing comes before him. If you're here tonight and you are ready to make that commitment and to stand before this body of people and say, I'm going to serve God. Ahead of everything else in my life, I'm going to uh, believe and follow and trust and hand my life over to Jesus and repent of my sins, turn away from those things that have separated me from God in the first place. I'm going to confess Jesus before this group of witnesses. You know, part of that confession means God is first for me now. Jesus is the son of God. What you're saying is he's number one from now on. And then die to yourself. You got that? Self is no longer first. Die to yourself. Bury that man in the waters of baptism. Come up out of the grave to walk in newness of God. As if, not as if, in such a way that he's number one in your life. If you need to do that tonight, come forward as we stand and sing the invitation song.